biggest favors you can do for your tracking, training, and progress is have a really clear picture of what a good track looks like. Do you know? Do you know what it looks like? When I first started, I, I really didn't know. I thought my dog was um, doing bad in areas that he was really actually doing quite well in, and I thought we were doing great in areas that uh, really could have used quite a bit of improvement. So the ideal picture that, that you want to shoot for is a dog who, let's say a street dog, stray dog, when you see them searching around the ground, looking for food, that's kind of the picture you want intense, dedicated, um, not pressured, not fast. So it's very hard to get that with some dogs and, and with some dogs you'll never get it, but that's kind of the picture that you wanna go for. At the same time, you're trying to get that intensity, that searching, really that hunting behavior. Um, you're also learning or gonna have to learn to compromise with your dog. You may have a dog who, especially once they realize that this is kind of a goal-oriented uh, exercise, Malinois, <coughs> they really like to do things and finish things and they're very goal-oriented dogs. So you may find yourself combating speed. And while you're combating this speed, it's very important that always in the back of your head, you remind yourself, don't break it all over something small. So I was listening to some of the wrong people when I first started tracking people in my ear. He's too fast. He's too fast. So I started trying to slow him down and ultimately broke more than, than what I gained. Um, so in certain situations, it's better to just compromise with the dog or try to solve certain things in ways that won't break everything else. You may not get exactly what you want for, but tracking more than any of the other phases is an area where you may need to compromise with your dog. So starting out, when you start with the puppy, you'll notice that um, people talk about scent pads and that's a perfect place to start with the puppy. And what this is, is it's, it's a hip width, hip width, hip width uh, area that you're gonna crush with your feet. You're stomping, you're crushing, and then you're sprinkling ideally small kibble around that scent pad. Now, why do we want it small? We want the dog to hunt not to just skip along gulping up big pieces of food as they go, right? We want the dog hunting 
That's what you want. You want all the power coming from here, not the legs moving. You want the power coming from here. So in order to do that, we need to make sure that the food is somewhat unavailable. We need them to learn to work for it a little bit. So what you may want to do with a lower food drive dog is take some ground beef, cooked or raw, whatever is your personal thing, um, and smush it in with your puppy's breakfast or dinner and use that to sprinkle on your scent pads. And you can do three, four scent pads at a time. You'll step into the scent pad and then you'll step out. So what I mean by that is try not to leave a clear exit and entrance. That way if you're, you don't want your puppy smelling where you came in on that scent pad and then you know there's no food there. So we kind of will take a big jump when we lay our scent pad and then we'll jump out of that scent pad. Uh, to make sure that there's only scent right there. And then once you're standing there with your puppy, don't move. That way your feet are over the two areas that caused scent. When you're doing your puppy on the scent pad, you'll see that we're pulling up a little bit and then we're letting the puppy fight and get back to the rewards and pull up a little bit and fight and get back to the rewards. So you can do that, you know, two, three times and on the uh, fourth, fifth time, you can actually take the puppy fully away. But you never ever want the puppy to finish the food on the scent pad and then stop himself. You always want to pull him away when there's more food there. That way in his head, he's always thinking, oh, that's that track where there's always food there. There's always food to be found on the track. So don't make that mistake of letting your puppy finish it. Take him off before he's finished. Now, your two legs, you're gonna see in some of the video that those two legs are always around the puppy. So there's kind of one on either side. And in the beginning, you want to do that because it prevents the puppy from spinning and circling. So you want the puppy learning to work in a fashion that's forward and backwards, not spinning in a circle. So they get to the end of that scent pad, there's no food. Maybe you even help them with the leash. Oh, there's the food. Oh, no food. Oh, there's the food. You can even, as the puppy's working the scent pad, you can even put more food behind them, teaching them to back up. Gosh. <clears throat> teaching them to back up and find the food, like here, not turn around and find it. That's not a behavior that we want to see. Then three, four days of scent pads, maybe more depending on your puppy's age, but at a certain point, you can start laying small tracks.
tracks, what they look like, they're inline footsteps. Why do we do that? Um, it teaches the dog to keep their nose down. If you put your footsteps wide apart, the puppy is going to pick his head up to go to those steps. And we don't want that. We want the puppy learning to snake, snake. Even when the footsteps start to become separate, we'll put a little piece of food in between. We don't want that dog's nose coming up. We don't want them learning that. And why? The nose up is a natural behavior. It's very natural for a dog to air scent. Um, but in Schutzen, it doesn't allow that. So we want to do as much as we can to keep the nose down. That nose down behavior will get them to be more accurate on that current corner. So if they start to learn to take their head up, they'll still eventually make that corner, but they'll be past it quite a bit and that's points off. Um, so you can start in line and you'll put food in each step. You might, with a real young puppy, you might put like three little tiny kibbles. So, you know, maybe the puppy finds one of them. Um, but you'll want at least one piece of food in each step and you'll wanna make sure it's important enough for the puppy that he finds it. Put the piece of food as deep as possible uh, while still ensuring the dog gets it. So for example, um, I worked with this one German Shepherd who had been used to just eating it off the top and she really wasn't willing to work at all for it. So I upped my food value, I put little um, ground meat, like frozen ground beef rolls that I had made, little, little pellets, and then I took a hammer in each of the steps, in the heel part, and I stuffed that down in there pretty deep. So the value was greater than what she was used to, but she had to work harder to get it. And then as she became accustomed to working harder, I eventually uh, could go back to a lower value food and not use meat all the time. Um, maybe cheese, maybe not meat. So there are certain things that you'll have to do that vary from dog to dog with tracking, particularly in regards with what food that you use, with what food you use. So then the next question would be, oh, how soon can I start picking up food? Um, I would say if you've been tracking for a few months with food in every step, and when I say a few months, I mean minimum three times a week for a few months, you can start to um, take the food up a little bit at a time. And when you do take the food up, try to put it on a little bit of a bend so that the dog isn't able to shoot forward. And this is particularly important with very high food drive dogs. One, um, one thing high food drive dogs get you is the willingness to track, but they also can be some of the most difficult to control uh, when it comes to speed. So oftentimes it's those medium food drive dogs that are the easiest to track with. They're motivated enough, but they're not so crazy about food that they just fly as soon as the food's up, which presents a whole nother set of problems. So if you have a dog who's higher, higher food motivated, you can take the food up. So let's say you know exactly where you took the food up and you can make a little bit of a turn. That way, if he comes off the track a little bit, you can help him get back on. Oops, he was not so careful. He lost the track and then he finds it. So with helping him, you might give a little pop, which leads me to my next point, um, popping when your puppy takes the food. So you'll notice in these videos that um, the puppy's eating, gulp, and a little pop comes right before. Pop comes down here, little pop happens. Just like that, it's just a wrist flick. Tap, tap, tap. Oh, I spit, ugh, sorry. So, so you're going to tap right when the puppy, or ideally right before the puppy takes the food. You know there's food in, in every step with the puppy tracks. So you can tap on each step as the puppy goes forward. And what this does is it layers in a tool that we can use later. If the puppy loses the track, or let's say he, he takes his nose up a little, a little tap, and then he associates that with finding food. So that tap on your, on your collar signals to him, oh, there's food. Now later, you may even bury food. The food may be even further down. And you can have a cue word, like I use dig deep, when the dog passes that buried food, so we can kind of trick them a little bit and that trickery makes them more concentrated. So let's say your dog's being a little too fast, maybe he's losing intensity after 20 steps. Hmm, okay, let's bury some frozen meat. I say frozen, 
because it doesn't smell quite as much. Let's bury some frozen meat. We'll mark it really well. Okay, it's right after the fifth post. It's the first step after the fifth post that I'm passing. And I know he's gonna pass it. I did a really good job of, of burying it. So right when he passes it, I can give a little pop. Dig deep. Oh, he knows right away. Dig deep, that's the digging cue. So when I'm first teaching them to dig for food, I'll use that verbal over and over again. That way when I correct him for passing, he knows exactly, go deeper, go more intense. And you want that pop on the leash to um, make them more intense, not to stop trying or to get worried. You want them to go, oh, I missed something. Now I'm gonna try harder to find it. So you can use that to um, create a dog that is a little more careful, little maybe a little slower, and also who is more intense with a deeper nose, because now they're really trying to figure out where that is. And you obviously you want it buried in a way where they can be successful. So you don't want it like buried one foot under and coming back the next day, but you don't want it so easy where they, you know, they can smell it three steps before. So you want them to kind of get to it and like almost do a double take like, oh, is there something there? And there's ways to be um, a little bit better about that than others. So if you've been tracking your dog now for three, four months and you're starting to do um, you know, maybe some curves where you're skipping three, four, five, six steps of food, then you've got you know, 10 steps of food, then two steps without, um, you're, you may wanna start doing some corners. And the first way I learned corners was really easy. So I like to tell beginners to do it that way because it's pretty hard to mess up. Um, and that's just using a scent pad as a corner. So you'll do a scent pad in this exact spot where you want your corner to be, and you'll exit that scent pad in whatever direction you choose. So let's say you do, you know, a, uh, a slight curve, 30 paces that way. Then you make a scent pad and then you do a 90 degree angle exit out of the scent pad. And when I say exit, your step that leads out of that scent pad should be connected. Okay. So in that scent pad, you might have 10 pieces of little food and the dog's tracking along, tracking along. Now he's goal oriented. So he wants to go. So he hits that scent pad. He takes one of the pieces of food. He goes over it, he continues on his way to find his goal, and there's nothing there. So you can give a little correction, and hopefully from all your puppy teaching on the scent pad, he knows that that little hydraulic pull needs to back up. Oh, there's food. Okay, so when I hit the end, I back up. There's more food here. You don't want him spinning, so be as close as you need to to make sure that he doesn't spin. He just backs up, he takes the food, He's eating, oh, there's more than one. And as he's eating, oh, look at this step. This goes somewhere. And then he finds the exit. Now, after the exit, I wouldn't put food immediately in that first step. I'd wait two to three steps if you can. If the dog's having uh, problems, you can put it in the first step. But I like the dog to absorb a little bit what happened. And since food and toy kind of block the absorption of what's going on, um, I like to put it a little bit more delayed, okay? That's how you can start your corners. And let's say you've got a few days to work on them and you only have a small area to work. That's a perfect place to work on your corners because you can make quite a bit of these turns in a small area. But just keep in mind, the more corners you do, oftentimes um, the more the dog starts to check when you do go on those long straights. So it's always a balance and your dog's always gonna do what makes sense. Your dog, what your dog does is a direct reflection of your training and of course genetics as well. So keep that in mind, if something's not going right, try to think, why is he doing this? What have I done that has made him choose this direction or this way of finding the solution? Um, being close to the dog on the track is ideal for a long time. 
You don't need to be way out on your line. That's something you can show the dog at any point. You can show that to them, but it's not something that you should do regularly. And, and the reason is, is you can't monitor your dog in a very effective way. It's kind of like healing all the time and never looking at your dog. You have no idea what's going on. So you need to be able to look and see what exactly your dog's doing and where they did it. The other thing that you have to be sure to do is mark your track or at least know exactly where you're going. If you don't have markers, if you're not gonna use them, it's better to stomp the sh out of your track and see it with your eyes than it is to make a hard track. Even if you're showing the dog that picture when they fail, you will not know when they failed or how badly they failed or if they're on it. So it's better to stomp the track in and at least have a visual than it is to make a really hard track that you have no idea what happened. So what I'd suggest doing is, is trying to track mostly in areas that you can see, like in the morning, there's dew on the ground, that's one area, or really beautiful grass you can typically see. And then make sure you do harder tracks that are less visible, um, like middle of the day where you can't see as much, but that you are religious about marking. So maybe you do it in a very simple fashion. So you start with your flag, you look at a tree or a pole and you know it goes straight towards that pole and you know it doesn't deviate, okay? That means that you can, you can, you know, if your dog starts to go that way, you can give a correction and you know you did it correctly. Or you can use chalk, um, which is what I like to use. You can use flags that you throw you know, throw them off so that they're not signaling to the dog or wooden stakes. But however you do it, you need to know exactly where you went. Nothing really can be accomplished if you don't know what you did. Next up, articles. For the beginner especially, um, there's really only one way to do articles. One, one, one. Just reward the hell out of it. It's pretty simple. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Do not correct your dog on the articles. You want your dog finding the articles, seeking them out, actively wanting to look for them. Articles are seven points. If your dog has an uh-oh moment because you've been correcting it to lay down and it's like, oh, there's the article, that's where I get corrected. Let's move past this real quick. That happens. Even when the dog indicates the article under pressure, it's very obvious. I can see it and if I can see it, a judge can see it. So you want your dog finding the article and being happy. The top trainers, ask Lars Lentz. There's no pressure on articles. Reward the hell out of them. Make the dog feel good so he fights to find them. Even if you get yourself, like I did twice, in a pickle where <laughs> the track was harder than the dog was prepared for, um, you want them fighting and fighting and fighting because they're looking for those articles because they like them, they value them. So. For the beginner, just focus on rewarding the hell out of your dog when he gets the article. You can start with a puppy by dropping the article on the floor and immediately dropping food. If somebody does that for a month, their articles are almost done. The dog will indicate. Whoop. Later you can add the down or you can add it you know, a few days after you start it, but just do it easy, gradual. It doesn't need to be crazy, okay? So don't worry about making like perfect, perfect behavior on articles. The main thing is that you don't lose any articles because that is a lot of points. Um, if the dog's touching a little or head bobbing, yeah, the judge might take a half point or something. But um, for the beginner, really, you just, you want the dog to find all of them and to stop at all of them. And the easiest way and the most reliable way to teach that is by big time jackpots. When your dog, as soon as your dog sees the article, you put the article on the floor, drop a big handful of steak. Take the article up, put it on the floor, drop a handful of steak. After you do that, you know, five, six, seven times, then you can help the dog lay down if you want, especially if he already has a little bit of that down behavior, and then drop it right away, okay? Articles don't have to be crazy. They don't have to be super complicated. The main thing is that your dog wants to find them. Line holding. One of the most embarrassing experiences of my IPO journey, IGP, Schutzen, whatever, was going to a Melanie Kruger seminar, one of the best tracking trainers in Europe. And uh, she was really appalled at my line handling. I guess I thought I had to micromanage everything. 
But line handling is something that you'll only get better on just the more you do it. Some people are a little bit better at it. It's very hard to quantify and to um, specifically say what you have to do, mostly because it varies so much with each dog. Some dogs track better on a loose line, some dogs track better on a tight line. Um, but the main area where people mess up is, is at the start. So the main thing I hear Marco, you know, yelling at people for is when they get to the start, they start fighting with the dog and pulling on the dog and then the dog shoots forward and now he's already going too fast. So make sure it's really calm. Calm begets calm. If you have to with your puppy, just pick him up and put him down right at the scent pad. It's not the end of the world. It's fine. Um, remember, tracking is tracking. The obedience before the scent pad is overrated by most club accounts. A very good judge doesn't typically care. The world level judges will tell you they do not care. As long as you're not helping your dog or correcting your dog, they don't care what happens before you say track. Just put the dog there and put them there in their calmest state, whatever that has to be. With some dogs, you know, I'll have a handful of kibble and I'll just re reward them with little kibble all the way up to the scent pad and then just let them go. And that'll be maybe the first year and a half. And then later I'll work on the, the actual presentation right there, but it's a, it's a very minimal priority. The main thing is, is that you're not pulling uh, as you approach, heel, heel, whatever you're doing. Don't make it this big conflict. Make it calm, be relaxed, and just go to the scent pad and just go. Don't pull back and then release. So finally, during, throughout your tracking training with your dog, um, monitor their behavior, video it if you have to, so you have a little log. Maybe that video happens once a month, but you have a little log of progression. Um, you don't want to continue on the path that you're going if you're noticing your dog running along with a high nose, casually, no intensity, not really trying to find anything. You don't want to continue on that path because then you actually make that a habit. It becomes quite difficult to fix. So when you start to see the intensity decline in your dog or you start to notice that they're speeding up, those are the big problems. Uh, every dog is gonna have issues with corners, um, you know, things like, things like that, but um, the high nose and the running, it, it's, that's a toughie. That's the dog that's become um, accustomed to finding the track using a solution other than what we want. We don't want them finding that solution of air scenting, which comes very natural to them. Um, so the other thing that you want to try to avoid, especially in your young dog training, is laying your tracks in the wind. When you go out to track, go here. The, the, the wind that's blowing, don't go towards that direction. If the wind's blowing this way, right at you, you're going to turn around and lay your track that way. Then maybe you can do a turn and then continue, but don't lay it into the wind. At some point you'll need to do that, but you want your dog's, the behavior of your dog keeping the nose down, you want that solid before you do anything into the wind. Because as soon as that wind hits the dog's nose, that natural tendency to come up is gonna happen. And we don't want the dog experiencing that while they're young. We want a nice solid year or so of the dog only finding the solution through keeping his nose down. All right, guys, well, hopefully I've helped you a little bit. Now the rest is on you. Tracking is a repetition game. The person with the most reps usually wins. And of course, the best natural tracking dog. But it's all about the repetitions. Not like obedience where you can kind of skate by with some things and you can fake others for a day. Tracking's not like that, boy. It's gonna show who's done their reps and who hasn't. So make sure you get out there enjoy your track. It's a beautiful morning. It's crisp. It's cool. You're the only one out there. It's peaceful. Learn to really appreciate those moments, those quiet tracking sessions by yourself. Maybe you showed up with a whole group, but now you're off by yourself and you're just enjoying watching your dog's genetic ability. Have fun.